Welcome to SBB University Caregiving Resources, Staying Connected to an Aging Relative. Today's program is going to focus on guiding families through difficult times of distance. I'm Kathleen Warshawski with Seniors Blue Book, and our speaker today is Mr. Benjamin Surmi. He's with Kelsch Communities and Arbor Hills Memory Care Community. I'd like to thank Seniors Blue Book and Arbor Hills Memory Care for helping to coordinate today's program. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Benjamin Surmi. Benjamin received his Master's of Science in Gerontology from California State University in Fullerton, and he is currently serving as a social gerontologist and the Director of People and Culture for Kelsch Communities. Thank you, Benjamin, so much for speaking with us on this very important topic, especially during this time of increased isolation for all of us. And now to our program, let's learn how we can stay connected to an aging relative. COVID, let's just say, we're still going to need the same exact strategies I'm talking about today to work with families. So keep that in mind. We're not just talking about a COVID world. We're talking about a world where it's hard to stay connected with an aging relative anyway. As uh, said before, my name is Benjamin, social gerontologist. Happy to be with you today. The question we're going to ask is how can we stay connected with an aging relative when I cannot visit? That's the question we're trying to answer. Um, now, I'm going to talk today about different tools in our toolbox. As professionals, we need tools in our toolbox so we can better guide families. Maybe you're a hospital social worker and you're talking to family members about this move home or this move to a retirement community or this move to an adult family home or to a nursing home or home care coming in and they're struggling with, well, how am I gonna stay connected in the situation where we're not supposed to visit or whatever? We need toolboxes so we can help them make a smooth transition, right? If we're in senior living, if we're in nursing home management, we need tools in our toolbox. If we are a geriatric care coordinator, if we are a financial advisor, these are questions on families' minds and so we need tools in our toolbox so we can suggest just the right thing to the right person. Before I talk about some of the tools, however, I want to just take a quick moment to note that there's strategies for visiting that we need to consider. Because a lot of times right now, what I'm seeing happen is families are jumping right into we need to do a video chat with mom or dad. Well, video chats don't always work great with an aging relative, especially if they live with dementia. Um, it, it's not always a satisfactory connection. It often doesn't feel like you've really connected with the person you care about. So a few strategies when you're talking with a family member about having a video chat, having a virtual visit or a window visit, is to give them some ideas of what to do. Because families are used to coming and visiting their loved one, then they might sit in an easy chair rocking back and forth, just looking out at the birds. Well, now they can't do that, right? So now their visit's truncated into a 20 minute, 15 minute, half hour segment, either in person with plexiglass between them, through windows, through a gate, or perhaps through Skype or FaceTime. So we need to get more thoughtful about what we do in that 15 minutes. Let's not let it be Dad, how are you feeling? You doing okay? Dad, do you got enough food? Dad, you got enough this? Are they treating you okay, right? That's not going to deliver any sort of connection at all. Um, so we need to keep present to what will develop some connection. So a few strategies for a short visit, um, often a virtual visit right now, is show pictures with screen share. Um, on a Skype call, I can share my screen and show my Facebook feed and show grandpa some of the things that kids have been up to. I can show my photo files and talk about what's going on at and with the kids or, or I can show them pictures of things that they used to really enjoy. Maybe they used to hunt and I can show them hunting pictures or something like that. Tell stories. It's very easy to get focused on the questioning, asking questions about how they're doing or something like that. Instead, tell stories. Tell stories about their life you know, kind of, hey, dad, I remember the time you and I, we went fishing and this is what it was like and you caught that really big one. And well, maybe it's a story about something that's happening in your own life, right? But tell stories, give a tour. Maybe you've just renovated your bathroom or your kitchen. Turn the phone around and show them 
what you've just been working on or the garden, maybe the garden's just blossoming. Show them a tour of the garden. Maybe you're at Whole Foods, right? They haven't been shopping in six months. Take them on a tour of Whole Foods, right? They will enjoy just getting out virtually because they've been so locked up in their home and have gone nowhere, right? Give them a tour of somewhere. Give them a tour of the park as you're taking a walk with the dog, right? Ask good questions. Sometimes we get so focused on the here and now, and yet one of the purposes of being an elder, one of the reasons we have elders in our culture to begin with, is to answer some of the bigger questions in life. So ask some beautiful questions, some good questions. There's a great website many of you know about called timeslips.org, timeslips.org. One of the features they have on there is beautiful questions to ask an aging relative. And these are questions that just get them to share wisdom, to share insight, right? It might be a question like, um, you know, what is a way you have found to welcome strangers into your life or into your community, right? You're asking about hospitality. How do you show hospitality? Why is that important to you? You're asking a good question that gets them thinking, right? What's a way you helped your children, dad, when they just didn't want to do their homework, right? That's not a question about the here and now. That's not a right or wrong question. That's not even a really a reminiscing question. It's a question, a beautiful question that gets them to share some of their insights, some of their valuable tips for living, right? Go there with some of the questions. Interview them. Say, hey, Grandpa, Grandma, we're writing a family newsletter, and we're going to cover different relatives and what's going on in their life. I've got some questions for you. When you phrase it like that, and when you create kind of a formal structure and you're taking some notes, it prompts people to say things they wouldn't otherwise say. If I'm just like, hey, dad, did you ever buy a car? You know, he's not, he's going to be like, what are you talking about? It's, of course I bought a car. What do you, you know? But when you say, dad, tell me about the first car you bought, right? It doesn't come out of the blue when you know, when he knows you're interviewing him, and you're going to write it down and share it with the family. He's going to share more things about that experience. Because remember, when we're very familiar with someone, we often just kind of don't ask questions anymore about all the stories we've already heard. And yet with elders, those stories are treasures to them. Those are stories that bring them back who they are and helps reinforce their identity and their sense of place in this world. And so asking questions, even about stories you already know, that might get them to go into more detail about them, that can be a great way to build some connection. Read. Many elders, especially those living with dementia, can still read to very advanced stages of dementia and to late in life with various disabilities. Have it mail them something in the in the mail that big print that they can read to you, right? Or if you have to read something to them, that's another great way to connect around a subject matter or a, a, a author or a type of writing that they really enjoy. And finally, if the person is a spiritual person, many elders have enjoyed prayer throughout their life, whether it's memorized prayers like the Lord's Prayer or um, uh, things called the Shema in, in Jewish faith. Um, they, they might enjoy that, or they may be spontaneous prayers, people who like to pray for needs of other people. And they may not be able to be at church right now or go to the prayer meeting or be part of those things. Praying over the phone again has been, I know for me, one of the greatest ways of connecting with elders in my life. And so I highly recommend that. Now, we're going to spend most of the day or more of this time we have together talking about age-friendly tools that are not mainstream tools, tools that you probably you may not already know about. That's, you know, that's what we're going to spend time on. Otherwise, you probably would find this not very valuable. However, I want to mention some tools that are very mainstream that either we don't think about when we're talking with elders, or we don't maybe, maybe include them in our toolbox, right? Um, because we are looking for some of the newer things like FaceTime, right? That, that's something that everybody immediately thinks, FaceTime, 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 that's the way to do it, right? Well, there's some non-new tech tools that are really just as valuable, mail by postal service. I mean, thank God we still have the postal service, but mail by postal service, that's something that's really valuable. Um, elders, that was the way that they communicated throughout their entire life. Even though we don't do that in the past 10 years, Elders we're serving today did that for 80 years, and now they're 90, and we don't send cards and letters anymore. So write a letter. Get the family engaged in writing letters. Um, In-person visits. Uh, you know, even though we've got the virtual, 
almost every elder in America, if there's an advocate who's willing to fight for it, can still have an in-person visit. It may be through plexiglass, it may be through a window, but there's almost always a way to ensure that in-person visit happens. If someone is on the third floor, there's a way to make sure it happens. They, there can be, there'll be a window downstairs that they can set up a chair and the person can look through the window and see, see you, right? So in-person visits, landline phone calls as well, um, Again, you know, cell phones, FaceTime, sometimes that's really not what the elders used to. And it becomes confusing for them or it becomes less, um, less meaningful to them because they're so focused on the screen. Okay, yeah, you see, yeah, okay, I got you, right? You know, all that stuff going on. Pick up the phone, just, just give them a call, right? And you might have a much better experience than even going to some of the new things we're gonna talk about today. So I wanna just remind us those are there. Now there are some new technologies that are also mainstream and I'm not gonna talk about them today, but I wanna make sure we're present that these are all in our toolbox, right? So we got the smartphone calls like FaceTime, like Skype, all that good stuff. We got the video chat. Um, we've got texting, right? I can text grandma a question. We've got email. We've got sharing videos and photos by smartphone. Those are all very valuable things to do. Quick note, I was talking to Dr. John Medina the other day, who is a um, kind of molecular neurologist, and uh, he mentioned to me that if you include in your email a picture of yourself, each time you email an aging relative, and then you change that picture in each email, you, they have research that demonstrates what that does to the elder's brain. And it's pretty significant in what it does to the elder's brain. So something that simple where you put a picture in your email and then you change the picture in each email as you send changes what their brain does when it reads that email. So just a quick tip from Dr. John Medina. Now, I want to be present to a little bit of research before we, we move on to some of the technology. First of all, your likelihood of living longer or just surviving, 50% higher if you have strong versus weak relationships, 2010 study. Loneliness, bad for us, excuse me, as 15 cigarettes a day. So if you're thinking about mom's blood pressure and you're thinking about her diabetes and you're thinking about all these other things and you're not looking at loneliness, like, I'm sorry, you, you really missed the boat because all those other things loneliness trumps most of them, right? The research seems to indicate that loneliness may be as bad for us, the poor diet, not getting exercise, a smoking, as obesity. So if we wanna look at health and we believe health is important, we've gotta look at loneliness because it is just as bad for us as a lot of the other big things that we spend most of our time working on when we're working with seniors. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few things that uh, social support has a positive impact on, such as our immune system and inflammatory processes. And there's things that when we don't get social support, we're gonna have poor wound healing. Who would have thought your wounds will heal slower if you don't have positive social support? Who would have thought, I mean, really, that your wounds would actually be less likely to heal quickly if you don't have a strong social network. An interesting study in 2008 of over 1,400 women in Southern California, I'm sorry, in California, showed that you had a 26% likelihood of reducing your risk of dementia if you had a large social network and you were almost 50% less likely to get dementia if you had daily contact with friends and family. Can you imagine that? We're talking about all this research for dementia, 50% less likely to get dementia just by having daily contact with friends and family. Maybe we'll get a drug one day, but until we get that drug, ch reduce your chances by 50% by ensuring that you've got a strong social life because that's where the research is pointing to so much of the risk of dementia. And then another quick study out of Oregon Health and Science University in, in uh, Portland, Oregon, Oregon Health and Science University, OHSU. They took, um, they took two groups. They had people with mild cognitive impairment, a, a kind of early stage of dementia, and they had a, another group of people without dementia. And they divided those groups in two groups. One of those groups would, um, one, one of both groups would do video chat every day for six weeks. The other one would do phone calls. What they found was the people who did video chat every day, they could measure the cognitive improvement after only six weeks. And that improvement lasted until the 18th week. 
That's what they noticed. The people who called on the phone did not have the same cognitive benefit. So I think what that tells us is that the reading people's faces, looking at someone's eyes, there's something else going on cognitively with all the emotional information that we read when we are in a conversation with people that really impacts our brain. And so if we're concerned about dad or mom and how they're doing and wanting to make sure they stay as cognitively intact as possible, we may need to consider something like regular video chats with family and friends instead of just relying on little visits here and there because there's research to show that it makes a difference. So what are some new age-friendly options and how do we choose the best option for our clients, right? Or, or guide them in making those uh, decisions. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to divide various age-friendly tools into seven categories for you today to kind of make us have at least one way of thinking about different tools. And you can also kind of put tools you find into these categories. And so the, number one is the most complex. Number seven is the least complex. We're going to go from being able, I can navigate a tablet with my fingers to all the way to I'm just passively sitting there and receiving messages, right? We're gonna go down that whole spectrum of complex to simple. Another way to divide up technology to make a decision about what a family member might want, what might work best, is to look at two factors. How significant is their dementia? And how much experience have they had with new technology? So give, let me give you an example. I might be working with an 80-year-old who helped create IBM's computers. He has mild to significant, mild dementia, medium dementia, right? He may be able to do more with technology than a 55 year old who spent their whole life using the television and a landline and have just finally been introduced to a smartphone. That 55 year old without dementia may do worse and not be able to handle technology as well as the 80 year old with some dementia who was introduced to new technologies earlier in his life. So just keep that in mind, it's possible. It's not the same for everybody, but it's something to look at, those two factors. How much has technology been in their life and how bad is the dementia? Because that will also, which technology you choose. We're also gonna ask the question, how often is a helper present in the person's apartment, their home, right? Because there's certain technologies that you're, they're age friendly, but they're only age friendly if there's a helper who makes sure it's plugged in, it's charged, that it's on the right channel, right? Because otherwise the elder is, oh, I can't get it on Wi-Fi. I don't even know what Wi-Fi is. You know, there's some challenges there. So some technologies, you really have to have a helper maybe come in once a week, right? Someone in the home who can kind of look at how things are going, right? If someone's really truly living all alone and their family's in Florida and they're in Chicago and you know, they're on their own, then you're gonna have to pick other technologies, right? And so, and how tech savvy are the helpers? There's some technologies that are super cheap, but you really need someone who knows what they're doing to set it up. And then there's other things that may be a little more expensive, but it's drop dead simple. I mean, it's like, it comes in the mail and it's like ready to go. And you have nothing to do except maybe plug it into the wall. Like you don't need any technology at all except how to plug something in. And then how engaged and driven are the family and friends to use some sort of communication tool? I've got family members who will send messages every week and will be, you know, schedule their video chats. And then there's other families who are really busy. They've got kids, they've got grandkids, they've got a career. And trying to schedule video chats with grandma, I mean, really, that's just, it's not going to work for that family. So they need something where they can do it without a schedule, anytime they want, they're gonna need a different kind of technology, right? Than the family that's like, hey, we've got five of us and we've all got it on our calendar and we're in, right? Every family is different. So you gotta know what kind of family you're working with as you suggest the right technology. And then where will the interaction take place? Is it right next to grandma's bed? Is it anywhere in the house? Is it at the TV? Because that's where grandma is all the time. Like, where is grandma, grandpa, your client most likely to use the technology that we might talk about. So first I wanna point out the three big players in this space. I'm not gonna go in depth on them because most of you already know about these tools, so there's no reason for me to tell you about them. Um, but the reason why I don't just suggest everybody use these 
is because these technologies, you know, they're not necessarily designed specifically for an aging person. Uh, they're not necessarily safe. In a, I, mean, I think if you know what you're doing, you can probably set them up pretty safe. So only, you know, the aging relative can only be contacted by their six grandchildren. No, they can't buy anything. They can't do anything that might um, get them into a scan or something like if you want to set it up correctly this may work for many elders and it's one of the cheaper options but many families are concerned about privacy they're concerned about what is google and amazon listening to they're concerned about whether or not someone can access their loved one without them knowing it and so for many families this is not quite the right option but i want you to know because for many it is and it'll work great so portal by facebook they've got four options they've got a tv option where you just plug it into the tv and the tv turns into a video chat experience for the aging relative and you've got some tablet options for people who want it at their dining room table or right next to their bed and they don't want to go through the television set right um no monthly fee you pay one time for the, for the equipment and there's no monthly fee now remember the reason it's free is because these three companies, their business model is to sell data, to sell commercials. So just keep that in mind. Amazon Echo Show is their option, their version of what Facebook does with the portal. Um, again, you're able to do these video calls with a internal speaker built right into it. And it's kind of within the Amazon Echo um, world. So it can do all the things that Amazon Echo can do. You can ask it to play music, ask it to do a variety of things, and it will do what you're asking it, as well as call your family and friends. Google Hub Nest Show, this is their version of what Facebook and Amazon have done. You've probably seen all the crazy commercials recently with the star from Portlandia, who's doing really ridiculous but super funny commercials around the, uh, the uh, Google Nest Show. You can see their pricing right there, just to give you a kind of a, a sense for how much you'll be spending if you decide to go with one of these options. Again, one-time fee, no monthly fee, really affordable option, way to go, especially if you have something, someone who knows what they're doing, set it up. And if video chat is the right option for that particular senior. If video chat's not the right option, then this is not the way to go at all. Now, let's talk about some of the less mainstream options that are designed by innovators whose sole purpose was design a technology for an aging person often with dementia so we're the most complex i navigate a tablet or smartphone with my fingers most of you are familiar with grandpad it's probably the most popular it's now available at target so you don't even need to order it online you can walk into target and pull it off the shelf and you're good to go uh, you can see large buttons this is a fairly more complex option than some of the op other options I'm going to show you later in the sense that um, it can do email, it can do browsing on the internet, you can have photos and phone calls and video chats and games. And it'll take your speech and turn it into an email, right? It'll read things to you. It's pretty complex in what it can do. And so it may be more complex than certain seniors need because then they might have to navigate. But those who want that functionality, as you can see, the buttons are really large, so it's very easy to navigate. It's press or scroll, press or scroll, right? Very easy to work with, um, as you can see from the screen in front of you, how easy the interface is for a senior to work with, and they can get help. They can ask for help, live help with just a click of a button. So they're not always having to call their family. It's not working, right? Now, it is um, easy to dock, easy to charge. You don't have to plug it in. The station stays plugged in. The grand pad just sits in the dock and family pictures start rotating through, which tells the senior that it's charging. So I like how easy it is to charge it. Now, it is um, cell only. So data through cellular network only. And the reason that the founders decided to do that was because they believed that getting kicked off Wi-Fi and having to deal with Wi-Fi passwords and Wi-Fi not working would make this very difficult for seniors that live alone. So it is connected to cellular data only. Uh, it's through T-Mobile. Oh, no. Cellular, consumer cellular, I believe, is who it's through. So if you go to grandpad.com or you go to the Target you, what you'll end up paying for is a monthly subscription for the data charge, right? That's really what you're paying for, plus a tiny charge for the actual tablet. Um, bald phone, I, I'm not going to go into smartphones today because I feel like if you can use a smartphone, you don't really need this presentation. 
but I want to just give you a taste of what's out there for smartphones as far as making them a little more senior friendly. Bulk phone is free. It's an app you can download on the app store and change your smartphone to be a more age friendly smartphone. As you can see, you don't have lots of little tiny icons all over your screen anymore. Instead, you have some very clear menu of the kind of things a senior typically wants to use their phone for and easier to read colors that are not as bright, easy, bigger letters, bigger numbers, right? Um, and so it's designed to make an easy experience for a senior with the things that they would need to use most from reminders to take a medication to easy to make video calls to family members. So that one's free. There's lots of paid options as well for specific types of phones that might work great. Oscar Senior is kind of like Grandpad, right? So now what I'm gonna show you next is some tablets that are similar to Grandpad, just they're just different. Um, and Oscar, one of the ways it's different is it's much, um, this is really colorful. They've chosen to make it vibrant colors, primary colors as the screen um, and put the family faces up front and center versus having to click call first and then see the family faces. So they've really tried to make it, um, they've really tried to make it uh, work well for seniors in that way. Now it is a tablet that you're, it's not a tablet like GrandPad in the sense that you you download the app to any tablet you want. GrandPad, you have to buy their tablet because they locked it down to make sure you can do nothing else with it but what it's there for. Oscar Senior, you can actually use different tablets, pick the tablet you want, and then use that Oscar Senior. Now, like many of the devices I'm showing you today, there's often a family app that goes with it. And so the family app lets you manage grandmother's tablet remotely. So you can um, send messages to it, you can call it, you can remove different apps if she's, maybe she's on the browser and she's going to Amazon and ordering a bunch of the same thing, right? You can remove that remotely. You can add who she's allowed to call and who she isn't, right? So you can really kind of go in there and make the app customized for where this person is in their journey. And a lot of the, the things I'll show you today have that. I'm just not showing you that app for everything I'm showing you today, but most of them have some sort of portal that the family can use to control. And if it doesn't, you really need to make sure you have someone in the home helping them, right? This is another option. I don't particularly like the interface as much as Oscar Senior or Grandpad. I feel it's a little too busy, a little, a little smaller than I like. However, this option also includes a lot of sensors. So someone is, you're needing to really check on their blood pressure, their O2 levels, their temperature. You really want to look the motion sensing, stuff like that. You can integrate different sensors with this tablet so that the family or the physician or the home health agency can do a little bit more of the clinical check-ins, even though they're not in the home. And the family net, this is a it's beta right now, so it's free online, but it's, and it's not like a standalone app or I mean, a standalone tablet or anything. Instead, it's a, it's a bit of a website app that you can um, do a lot with, with aging relatives. The idea is that you create a family circle where we can help the family stay connected, right? So one of the ways it does that is cross-generation translation. You have different generations. A, a grandpa speaks Japanese, granddaughter does not. How do I communicate? Well, it's translating the messages for you. Uh, it may also allow you to have, um, if you have hearing or vision problems, it will, it will help you um, hear. It'll speak to you messages or it will let you dictate messages, right? And so you're able to use the functionality for different accessibility challenges, different disabilities, hard of hearing, I can't see all those things. A fine motor skills are complicated. It makes it easy to type if it's, if it's challenging for you. So that's a free one. Um, you know, someone needs to know how to like open their computer and get to it, which cancels a lot of people out. But if they're able to at least do that much, it does, it's a free app that lets you communicate together. Now this next one, um, it is on a tablet or smartphone. However, it really, you really probably need to have someone hand the phone or hand the tablet to the elder for what I'm gonna show you next, because it, it's really focused on people living with dementia. And so, um, and here's the, the thing that they're solving, which I love. This is the team out of Israel. This is brand new. It's not in the United States yet. We're piloting, piloting it at one of our communities in the U.S. But 
video chat just is not easy with dementia. I mean, they might not even know they're looking at a screen. I mean, the screen is a TV. You don't talk to a TV, right? I mean, whoever talks to a TV, right? You're crazy if you talk to a TV. Um, and here they're being asked to talk to a TV, right? And so video chat can be hard with late stage dementia, right? But we know that music is really powerful. We all, four years ago when Alive Inside came out, like every one of us got all on the bandwagon about personalized music for seniors with dementia. Well, Together has married video chat and music for dementia. So what they're doing is they've created a tool that creates playlists of music for the senior while it watches their face to see how they respond to different music. So it's reading their emotional cues and curating lists of songs ready to help, under, help this elder with dementia. Now, it can then adjust what it's playing based on how the elder is responding in any given day. So they've been doing this for about a year, this piece of it. But this year, they've added the video chat function. So now I can be away from my grandfather, and he can be listening to music. He's got dementia, he's listening to music. I'm in another state, and I can listen with him at the same time. He's seeing me, I'm seeing him. We're listening to the same music at the same time, and we're able to have a moment of connection because you know how music unlocks the brain for people with dementia. And so here you go. This is a perfect marriage of these two things. I want to see grandpa's face, but he doesn't even know necessarily know who I am, or he doesn't know what to say, and I don't know what to say to him. And it's just not going. Now we can listen to music together. And he's going to say things he wouldn't have said if I just asked him questions, because he's listening to music that he loves, that matters to him, that really resonates with him, right? So this, I think this has a lot of potential. It's not being used in the US yet. It's just it's not. So if you want to get in on the pilot, definitely go to their website, together. I think it's together.fun and get on the beta mailing list because you want to you want to check this out. Um, it has a ton of potential for anybody caring for people with dementia. Here's a rundown of the pricing. Um, again, don't feel like you have to write all this down. I'm going to make sure that Kathleen has a copy of this so you can access this. Um, the last one I mentioned, $99 one time. One time. And it's free for life for a family, right? Uh, the rest of their life, they can use it. It's no, no monthly fee. If you're a community and you're handling, you know, 300 residents, 100 residents, it's more like $300 a month to have this app available for all of your of uh, your seniors, which obviously saves a lot of money if it's $99 a person. It's like three people, the cost of three people. So anyway, that's the pricing. Now, I can navigate a tablet by voice. All right, so here's the deal with that. Um, let, we're really talking about like the Echo Show where you can see the screen and you can do video chat there, right? Um, Sound Mind is a company that came in and said, okay, we want to make the Echo Show more senior friendly. So what they do is the family member calls the company ahead of time and gives them the Wi-Fi password, tells them who they can call, who they can't call, give them all the details. And then they ship it and they just plug it in. That's all they got to do. And they can immediately start using it. Whereas an Echo Show that you buy at the store, you'd have to set it all up, get it all ready, plug it in yourself, you know, make it happen. SoundMind makes it all senior friendly to begin with. And then they've added different skills such as getting engaging content. So playing Jeopardy, playing different games, reminding them it's time to exercise or take their medication, taking them a trip down memory lane where it shows them pictures and songs and stuff about a specific time in their life. And so it helps kind of prompt reminiscing. And then of course provides the video chat as well, right out of the box. Brio Care is trying to do the same thing um, as well. Um, and they're about $20 a month. So that helps someone navigate a tablet by voice. Now I can navigate a TV without a remote. I think this one has more potential than we realize and I don't see as many people using this yet. I'm going to show you several technologies that all do about the same thing. We're going to pilot one of them at two of our assisted living communities. I'll show you that one. Um, Cradle. This is the one I'm going to pilot. Brand new. It's from the UK. It's not even allowed to be sold in the US yet. I think we'll get our first shipment in October because they just came out with this. So what they're doing, oh my gosh, look how simple that remote is. Four buttons, 
Okay. How many of you work somewhere where you like, I can't do my TV. Can you sell my TV? And you're like constantly going back, changing people's HDMI, changing all this stuff. Okay. Not only is it simple, but it turns their TV into a whole video chat experience. Like they don't need a tablet anymore. Many of the seniors we work with, they didn't use tablets. They didn't use cell phones. They didn't use computers. Their way of interacting with the world was their television. Our, my way is a smartphone right? Don't make me use a television. I don't even have a TV in my house. But seniors, most of them had a TV in every room in their house. That was how they communicated with the world. That's how they got their information. Now we're asking them to all of a sudden change everything and use a cell phone, use a tablet. Like, why make them change? Let them stay with what's familiar to them. So that's what these companies are really working on is getting the core functionality the senior needs into the TV. So what it will let them do is they can communicate with their family, even multiple family members. You could have four family members on the same call and they're calling their dad and their dad is able to see them on the TV. They can see dad through his TV. You can have telehealth visits with doctors and nurses. You can have exciting activities. If you've part of like a memory care or assisted living or something like that, you could have streaming activities in. The family can text photos and videos right to the TV. So the TV just shows pictures of the family and little videos of the family, not even a live call. Like, there's so much you can do with just the TV now. It's, it's incredible. And it's really, really um, affordable too. So that's what Cradle looks like. That's what we're going to pilot in two of our assisted living communities to see how it works for us. Hey Herbie does a similar kind of thing. Um, that's their setup. That's what it looks like. And, and um, this is a, yet another option that does something very similar. And Independa is is right now available in the United States for the consumer market. You can you can buy this immediately. I do like their commitment to making it as easy as possible for seniors. I talked to the CEO. Really like his vision for this company. They've been actually around since 2014, so they've been around for a while. And so they've been working on dealing with a lot of the bugs before anybody else has. So really look at Independa as another great option. Medication reminders, call them, et cetera. The best ones, make sure if you're gonna get a TV deal, make sure it does what I'm showing on the screen right now. They're watching their TV program, the messages comes up over it. They should not have to go into HDMI and change the input and the, to get to their app or something. It needs to completely take over the television so they can watch their TV, take a message, take a call, and then go right back to their television show. There should be no changing channels to or inputs if you're going to use a TV, uh, a TV version of communication. It's got to be dead simple. Uniper also uh, is doing the same kind of thing. They're currently available just for communities. And their whole focus is they create a bunch of content as well as allow the video chat. And so the seniors can have all kinds of activities and stuff curated for them that they can participate in. Now, um, you're looking at about 150 bucks to buy one of these systems, and then it ranges from 15 to $75 a month to continue to operate the system. Now, let's say I can only push one to two buttons on a screen. Okay, well, that's where these come in, right? Tablet's too hard, TV's too hard, remote control's too hard. I just can punch some buttons on a screen. Okay, well, Comp is about to launch in the U.S. We're probably six months out here, and it's designed to look like an old-fashioned TV with no buttons, only a dial to provide in interaction with family members as well as beautiful, beautiful scenes that they can look at. So she Avi is out of the United States and it is a tablet on a stand. So it, it's all built together. It's not gonna lay down. It's always gonna stand up. So it can stand next to the bed, stand next to the chair. And it sole purpose is to bring communication between family members and their loved one. And so they just make it really easy. Like you pretty much just have to click, yes, I want to take the phone call and the phone call comes on or you click the person's face and you're calling the person, right? So they've made it very simple. It also integrates messages as well as pictures that the family can send right to the device itself. So even if the family doesn't have time to talk, they can send a quick good morning message to their grandmother, their father, and it shows up on the screen. That's what the family app looks like. That's what the fan, how the family would interact with that device. Connect does the same kind of thing. They're they're head-to-head -head competitors. I think where Connect is really put a lot of their focus is making 
um, their, their device as accessible to different disabilities. So for instance, it's one of the few screens you can touch with a glove, you can touch with a pencil. Most screens and tablets, you have to touch with a human finger or you have to touch with a special stylus pen. They've made their screen possible that anything that touches it will work. They've also made it extra loud. They've really made it a little heavier so people won't carry it. They'll keep it in one place. Um, you can see their interface right here and how you would make a call to a family member, how you would answer it. And they've incorporated speech to text. So if grandma's having a hard time hearing you, even though it's loud, they can read what you're saying, right? They've also made this modifiable. So if you're in a hospital bed that has a pole, you could hook it under the pole. They've really tried to think through different accessibility features to make this work for not only I'm aging and I may have some cognitive decline, but I have physical problems too. And then view clicks is a little simpler version of the last two I showed you. It's more of a picture frame, wireless picture frame that also does video chat. Now, these are range from about $300 one-time fee for the view clicks to 700 bucks for the Connect. And then Sochi Avi and Connect have a monthly charge of about $25 a month to keep those going. I can answer a phone. Okay, well, um, obviously that's easy enough. I don't need to tell you too much about that. However, one of the challenges with answering the phone is co coordinating schedules between an aging relative and busy family members. Family Jam does it automatically for almost nothing. You put in the numbers of the family members that wanna stay connected with their aging relative over the phone and it learns their lifestyle by calling them at different times of day and different days of the week and when they pick up, when they don't, when they say they wanna talk, when they don't, it ends up learning the family within about a week so that it calls you and it calls your grandma at the same time you're both available. So it, it really makes calling realistic because otherwise people have a good intentions and they never follow through. This makes it realistic for a whole family to stay connected. Uh, telecom is a service that makes it easier to have a person living with dementia have a phone in their apartment because of all the challenges that Alzheimer's brings. For instance, it stops them from calling the same person over and over again. It has quiet hours where they can't call people after a certain time of night. It doesn't let them contact spammers. It doesn't let spammers contact them. It won't let them call um, the home shopping channel. It will reroute 911 to the front desk if they're living in a community or at least notify the family too if they've called 911 so the family can get on it right away before the fire department gets there. So it really makes it easy for people with Alzheimer's to continue having a telephone. I recommend using a phone like this where there's either names or faces on the phone itself so that they can easily dial the people they need to dial. And then also recommend if you have to use a smartphone, possibly using a attachment like this that can make a big difference in the senior actually using it and actually understanding what's going on better. So you can see the pricing there. Now, I can read or look at printed photos. So some seniors, like they really need something in their hands. Video chat just isn't their thing. Phone calls are, are great, but they need more than they need the visual, but the video stuff's just too complicated or they need that tangible in their hands. Well, we're piloting this in one of our Montana communities. And so far it's been so, it's just been amazing to watch what's going on with some of these seniors. So what happens is the family has an app like this. They're posting pictures and messages anytime they want. And then every Monday, the senior gets a real, printed newspaper with pictures and messages from their families. Some of the residents that we have who are piloting this, their families in Japan, right? They got family members in Japan and they're seeing pictures from them in a printed gazette that looks like this. This would be folded, two pictures per page, plus a message, really easy way to see who sent me the picture, when did they send it, and what's it about, right? They're loving it. They're absolutely loving it. We're four weeks into the pilot and I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, it's helping with some sundowning issues at night. It's helping people who haven't seen their family for years. Like we're getting some really amazing responses using this, this feature. Um, it's tangible, it's printed. And then the family can also receive pictures back as well uh, on the app of grandma saying something or grandma doing something. So love what it does there. Now the pricing there is for if a family purchases on their own, pricing we're using is related to having a whole community use it. But for a family using it, mean, you're talking 745 to have it mailed to the elder once a month, 2275 
to have four mailed every month to the family member, no, ever, no matter where they are in the world. Finally, I can't do anything except receive messages passively. Well, I showed you these three options earlier. All three of these screens will let you set it up to accept messages with maybe a 20 second delay, but they don't have to click anything. So you can set it next to their bed, they're on hospice, they can't touch anything, they can't do anything. And family members can call in at any point. Just like, Grandma, I wanna sing you a song. Grandma, I wanna pray for you. Grandma, I'm here to say hi to you, right? And they're all over the country, but they can all call in to her even though she can do nothing now other than lay there and listen passively. So I'm gonna fast forward a few of these things. Um, I just wanna remind us, so ask ourselves the question, what will be frustration free for my aging relative or my client? What will my family actually use? Does everyone have the right kind of device? Does it match their lifestyle and habits? Will the system be failure free? Is the power source easy to use? Will powering on be easy? And is it fun to use? Those are some of the questions to ask when you're trying to decide what option should I suggest to one of my clients? So with that, I'll take any questions that you might have, or you can text or email me with questions as well. Kathleen, would you mind if there's any questions, please let me know. I will. So if you have any questions for Benjamin, if you would put them in the Q&A tab, that would be appreciated. There's also a way for you to raise your hands, but I'm not sure that I know how to see that, but um, if someone does raise their hand, I can allow you to speak. Well, it's been, um, this has been one of the most in demand topics over the past few months because families and professionals everywhere are trying to come up with really strategic ways to ensure that elders are staying connected. So I'm really thankful for all 40 of you who came today because as professionals, this demonstrates that you also really are concerned about loneliness and its impact on seniors. So thank you for being here today. Well, Benjamin, thank you for sharing all of that great information. There was a lot of technology there that I am not that familiar with. And so now I'll be researching some of it um, to see how it can help other people as well. We do have a few questions or comments. The first one is from Rita and Rita says, um, great and very useful information. And Thank then uh, Tacey Hicks uh, wants to know about the handouts. Um, yes. And I know that you're going to send those to me. And then when I send people their continuing education certificates, I will include the links to receive those handouts. We'll also be posting them on the Seniors Blue Book website, along with a recording of today's program so that you can share it with your families um, so that they can uh, be seeing it and get all of these great tips and takeaways that you may or may not remember that Benjamin shared with us. And the way it will come to you is it'll be, there'll be a link to a blog article. The blog article actually has a link to everything I talked about as well as a link to the slides. And so it will give you both options to either click right through to things or to see the slides. Perfect, I appreciate that. Well, thank you for having me, Kathleen. Pleasure being with you. So much. It was a wonderful program. And uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that we do have um, some other programs coming up. And the first one I wanna talk about is our caregiving resources for next month. Benjamin is going to be our speaker again. It's going to be on Wednesday, October the 21st, the same time from 1 to 2, 10 p.m. And he's going to talk about an engaging an aging relative with dementia, top dementia-friendly virtual strategies, and tools for professionals when consulting with families. So I'm really looking forward to that topic. And then uh, we're going to be working on some programs for November and December as well. So stay tuned. Benjamin is going to um, share a little more of his wisdom with us in the months to come. So thank you, Benjamin, um, and to Stacy and Arbor Hills and Kelsch Communities for making sure that we're going to be seeing some of those programs and getting that information and education. Um, I also wanna thank Seniors Blue Book. Make sure that you know that Seniors Blue Book is available um, in a digital format and in print edition. If you need copies, please email me. I'm happy to get those for you. We also have our Discharge Planners Resource Notebook, um, and that is for all of you. It's the only caregiving resource in the Dallas area. Again, I thank Arbor Hills 
uh, Memory Care Community, Kelsch Communities, Benjamin, Stacy, Seniors Blue Book, and SBB University. I also want you to know that your evaluations um, must be completed by tomorrow in order to receive your continuing education credit. If you don't receive your evaluation, if it doesn't pop up on your screen today, immediately, like within five minutes after the program, then you need to email me today at Kathleen at SeniorsBlueBook.com and I'll see that you get that. I also want to share um, that the DAGS Fall Forum is coming up. It's an all day event. It is actually on October 15th with a networking social on the 14th. And the DAGS Fall Forum is gonna talk about social determinants of health, healthcare disparities, Dementia 2020 update. We also have Dr. Wang with uh, Dallas County and UT, UT Southwestern. He's gonna talk about uh, COVID. Uh, we have advancements in telehealth with Dr. Brett Morin, and he is um, with Parkland Hospital. So we've got a great program lined up, and I will also include that when I send your CEU certificates to you as well. So again, thank you all for attending today. Thank you again so much, Benjamin. We really enjoyed your program. And I'm Kathleen with Seniors Blue Book, Resources for Aging Well.